over the past couple months, we've talked a lot about the spring game, Jim Knowles defense. We've even had a weekly check-in to talk about future Buckeyes. But we have not talked about freshmen that will make an impact in 2022. Here to tell us about three freshmen who will make an impact in 2022, it is Drew Crabtree. He's the managing editor of LWO Sports. You would not want to miss this conversation right here on Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked on Buckeyes. Part of Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is... Tuesday, May 17th in the year 2022, and I want to thank you for making Locked on Buckeyes your first listen or first watch of every single day. Today's show is all about the youngsters. Many of them are already on campus, and we are excited to discuss some things that we are going to see in the fall from freshmen. Yes, we could have had a list of four or five or six but only three made the cut today. Drew Crabtree, the managing editor of LWO Sports, is back with us. I love having him on. We have a good time together. And it's always enjoyable to talk about Buckeye football with somebody else that loves the team as well. And joining us now here on Locked on Buckeyes, it is a returning guest. It is Drew Crabtree. He's the managing editor of LWO Sports, and he writes – Bengals. He's a Bengals writer for Last Word on NFL. Drew, how you doing, man? Hey, man, I'm doing great. Love being on the pod. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm glad to have you on. Like I told you, I think it was last week now, I told someone recently, and I was talking about you, and specifically, and I said how much I enjoyed having you on previously on the podcast. So I'm personally glad to have you back and allow us to talk some more Ohio State Buckeye football, because we both love it. Yeah, I can talk Buckeye football all, time, all the time. I mean, every day I wake up and I go um, you know, I go with the three Locked On podcasts that I listen to, Locked On Buckeyes, Locked On Reds, as hard as it is, and my uh, my Locked On Bengals uh, with Jake and uh, James. So love the love everything you guys are doing. <laughs> Thanks, man. I really, really appreciate that. The Reds are um, a hot nest. That's a that nice word to, way to put it right now. <sighs> um, yeah. The Bengals um, are still making some strides to improve. I don't know how you're a Reds fan, honestly, right now. Well, I do know how. But um, I bet your level of frustration keeps going up with the way things are going with that franchise. It is about as immeasurable as possible. I think the fact that Joey Votto is still a red is the only thing keeping me sane. But even then, he's struggling, as I mean, as is everybody. Um, someone asked on Twitter, how, how do you – like, do you watch the games? Do you, what, how do you take in without trying to support the ownership? And I'm like, I listen to it. I, I listen to it. I like their radio um, broadcast, but it is very difficult. Three and nineteen as of uh, this Monday, and it's just there's no there is no light at the end of this tunnel. I mean, we can we can cop out and say there's a bunch of injuries, but it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, I thought the Cubs were doing bad this year, but three and nineteen—that's atrocious. That's bad, man. It's they, uh, they. I think I tweeted they have won three games, that they but they have been swept five times. They've been swept okay. more times than they have won a game. Just <laughs> awful. Oh, man. Well, hopefully, the, <laughs> the good thing is that Ohio State, if they were that bad. Um, we would not have a show. I know we would have a show, but, it, we, but they're not that bad. The Ohio State is not that bad at football or basketball. Basketball, there's, it's a whole different story. But the football team is still amazing on the football field. Two loss season, people go crazy. But I don't think it's going to happen next year. Before we get to next year on the football field in the shoe, let's go to next year in the NFL. The NFL draft just took place. Six Buckeyes got drafted. Two signed undrafted free agent contracts. And I believe the rest, uh, my math is off right now, the rest of those got invites to rookie mini camps. What Buckeye do you think will have the biggest splash during their rookie season? 
I I would love to say Demario McCall because I've loved him ever since he started playing, but I know that's not realistic. Um, it's got to be one of those receivers. Um, I want to say Garrett Wilson because, you know, Garrett Wilson is just this phenomenal, should have been the first wide receiver taken talent. Um, but I've also thought that the, the Jets were going to be, we're going to hit with more and Denzel Mims, and I was wrong. So in terms of the six guys that were drafted, it's got to be Olave. Um, you know, you're getting into an offense that loves to to throw the ball, even though they have Alvin Kamara, who is one of the best running backs in the um, league. He's going to be opposite, hopefully, a healthy Michael Thomas. And both of those route runners, shut up. So I think of the six, I think Chris Olave is probably the best. I'd love to see Jeremy Ruckert um, go off, but the Jets have 15 tight ends on their roster, so I don't know where he fits in. <laughs> I'm right there with you, though, with Olave. Um, I do believe that Olave possesses a skill set and a smoothness in, in and out of its routes that you rarely see. I don't care if it's NFL level, college level. You rarely see how smooth in his break, out of his break, up the field, yak yards. I mean, you don't. You rarely see the things that he has on the football field. The scary thing is he's not – to me, he wasn't the best receiver on Ohio State. It was Garrett Wilson. And Garrett Wilson's ability to go up and just get the ball, get those 50, 50 balls, that kind of separated him away from a lot of guys. But the smooth operator that Chris Olave is, man, and going down to New Orleans and that being – a better run franchise than the New York Jets. I firmly think that's a big reason why he is going to flourish because not only are the Jets a better franchise, better run franchise, but also you have a fan base that is behind you. They love Ohio State players. I mean, you've heard me say it numerous times. Pete Werner last year, Malcolm Jenkins just retired. You have Michael Thomas. I mean, they, they, they still love Will Smith. And so you, they have the Buckeye connection. So that alone is going to bring you in. But it's just – if you take all the other connections of franchise, Olave's just good, man. Like, he's just good. And I do think him going, him having a better quarterback, it's just going to be kind of tough to say if Jameis Winston is a quarterback. But him possibly having a better quarterback down there, um, I, do, I still think that Olave is – we're on the same page. Olave will probably have the bigger splash his rookie season. I just can't wait to see him play down in the bayou. I might have to get a jersey because uh, he's one of those guys I want to rep for a very long time. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my brother is a little bit less on following a certain NFL team. Like I'm diehard Bengals. I like seeing Buckeyes succeed as long as they're not in Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, but I know that um, if he's watching this, act surprised. I'm probably going to get him an Olave jersey for Christmas this year because I've gotten him Michael Thomas jerseys and all these other things. Um, but you know, Jameis Winston has been known to sling it. He's also been known to sling it to the other team. But, you know, last year he was working with um, a significantly better touchdown and interception ratio before he got injured. So I'd like, I'm, I'm very interested to see what they can do. I was kind of hoping for like a Desmond Raider to go there. Um, but I think he went to a pretty good um, spot in Atlanta. He did. And I think Atlanta needed a quarterback. Um, I know they have Marcus Mariota, but he's still mm -hmm. a backup, I do believe, to me in the NFL. So um, Desmond Ritter, I, I'm not the biggest guy to throw rookie quarterbacks right there into the water. But that might be what's needed to happen down there. Now, granted, you have you do have Kyle Pitts. They drafted Drake London. So you do have a couple guys there that, that, that are going to be able to get the ball, get open. Just got to find a guy to sling the ball to them. Um, I do like New Orleans. Um, I don't own a New Orleans Saints jersey. I think the last jersey, NFL jersey that I bought was an Ezekiel Elliott Dallas Cowboys jersey. Of all things, I also have a Carlos Hyde 49ers jersey. I said, how about mm -hmm. I get a Buckeye? I love Carlos Hyde. It went, in, it went into the thing that I wanted because I didn't want to get it more NFL jerseys. But the Chris Alave one to New Orleans, I might have to get more of a color rush or an alternate jersey. If he keeps two, that'd be great because you can keep the CO2 type of uh, branding that he started at Ohio State. Um, if, if I get Chris Olave, I might as well get Michael Thomas too because, I mean, he's there. And those two together, my gosh, that's a deadly duo. That's You're going to have a, a tough time uh, assuming that Michael Thomas is back and fully healthy. Those are two serious route runners. Um and then obviously when we when, when he went to the the combine, Chris Olave whipped out that speed that it didn't feel like he he had that that ridiculous speed when he was playing at Ohio State. And then when he tested the forty time, everyone was just like, 
wait a second that's not fair <laughs> like he's got he's got the hands he's got the the mentality and the grit he's got the route running and then you add this the ridiculous speed shut up that's not fair <laughs> no no it's not fair it's not fair what also is not fair is the amount of talent ohio state has in their freshman class coming in right now um you wrote an article on lwo sports about um three buckeyes i want to get the title correct so i'm not butchering that as i scroll up on my computer it's three Ohio State players, Ohio State freshmen, excuse me, who will make an impact in 2022. We just talked about a receiver in the NFL that we believe will make an impact in 2022. But you wrote about three guys. And I'm going to go first one very quickly. Was a safety that I do believe, oh, my gosh. When I was there at the spring game, I was wowed. And I said, who is that guy? Like, what is his number? Um, where is he coming from? Like, how good is he? Like, what year is he? I'm figuring out all these things here because – one, they don't give you paper rosters. So I had to go on Twitter and get a Ohio State beat writer. He tweeted out the the pictures of the roster. So I had to go there and I said, oh, Kai Stokes. He wowed everybody at the spring game. And I'm not surprised why. He is the first player that you listed in th as three freshmen who will make an impact in 2022 for the Ohio State Buckeyes. He is – he's going to – he's coming into Columbus, um, you know, a little under the radar. Because when it comes to the safety class, you think Sonny Styles, who, who is a baller in his own right, but he's going to be joining the team in the fall. Um, but that safety room, which used to be really, really crowded, is thinned out. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got Proctor and McAllister, um, two very, very good players. Then... Kai Stokes can definitely challenge for that. I mean, Lathan Ransom is still a stud, but like in the last six months, uh, Amir Reap and Jason went, obviously had their legal issues and got kicked off. Craig Young is gone. Bryson Shaw, uh, to many fans' uh, chagrin, is gone. Um, then, you know, Andre Turrentine and Marcus Hooker have all since transferred out. Um, Kai Stokes has a real chance, and he's going to come in with that chip on the shoulder that he's, you know, not even the top safe, top rated safety, even though he's, you know, he's just an athlete coming out. Um, and if I remember correctly, Denzel Burke was like a low four, even a three star mm -hmm. athlete coming out of high school. Um, and Kai Stokes just was everywhere. He's going to need to change that number. 37 isn't a pretty number for, for a safety. Um, but he's everywhere. He made plays. I'm surprised he didn't come down with an interception as Turrentine did, um, considering, you know, excuse me um in thud you just want to throw the ball because it's pointless to, to run it um but kai stokes is going to make a name for himself at least this year even in the rotation and then when proctor and McAllister are gone next year i think kai stokes is going to be that guy that they call on um to start the season in 2023 it's something that was said during the spring game i was there with with jeff hunt who's a frequent guest on the podcast and if i said it before i'll say it again don't really does not a big deal he said during the spring game numerous times he's not going to wear number 37 very long like once he moves up the depth chart and he's able to get get a different number he's going to be a player that does not wear number 37 because that's not a number that your average or i mean you're really good or starting safety or player normally picks to wear but when you're a freshman, you're a newcomer, and you just got to pick what's there. Like, hey, man, 45's available. You're a safety. I don't want to wear 45. Well, it's too bad. It's the only one available. Well, I guess I'll wear it. Numbers to players, and I know when I, myself, I like number five. I like number 25. Um, I like number eight because of Kobe Bryant, but I don't really want to, that number to be on my jersey. I, pre I would prefer five or 25. Everybody has their own numbers. So I do. I'm like you. He's probably going to pick a different number. But his range, to me, in real time, that stuff you see from guys that have been seasoned at the college football level, not a newcomer, not a guy who's technically a senior in high school, you don't see that stuff very often. And so I'm excited. You taught, you did a very good job of listing the guys that have transferred that are not on the team anymore. A couple of guys got kicked off. Like, there's so much absence and there's so much space in that room that Kai Stokes coming in, I think the spring game was just a great way for him to catapult going into fall camp and say, hey, like, 
I know what I can do on the field, and now i got to prove it to you guys more and more and more that I deserve a shot, and I do believe he'll get some time and some run in the fall because he's just too good to keep off the field. It'd be it'd be kind of funny if he ends up taking um, Bryson Charles 17, that everybody was uh... – there are a lot of people that I followed on Twitter that wouldn't explicitly say his name. They just said 17. Um, <laughs> it, it'd be hilarious if he ends up picking up that number and then people have to just code switch. It's like, wait a second. I hated that number last year. He's really good. For a lot of people, they take a lot of stock in the black stripe. And he was the first one to get his black stripe removed um, of the of this freshman class, which is small. Yeah. It's there's 21 incoming freshmen and then the two transfers of Chip and uh, McAllister. And when you compare that to Texas A&M, who has over 30, um, and they're all quality. So this this freshman class is going to be ridiculous. And I think Kai Stokes is probably the best one to bet on making a legitimate impact um, as Denzel Burke did last year or as... Um, Trevion Henderson, which we all knew he was he was the truth coming in, and it was only a matter of time. That's a conversation for another day, because I would love to possibly have you back on to talk about Trevion Henderson and the <laughs> running back specifically, more so him and Mayan Williams as a dynamic duo in the backfield. But like I said, I'll, we'll, we'll discuss that one down the road, because I do yeah. think you will be a good person to talk about with that. But moving on, because we don't have much time left. Drew, I could talk all day. The yeah. second person you had... Is another fan favorite, someone that helped in recruiting, bring guys into the recruiting class, is C.J. Hicks. Why was he number two and not number one? I, I think the only reason that he's number two and not number one is um, the way that they're going to be playing defense this year yeah, is yeah. very different than what we're used to with the Buckeyes. Um, I think there's a number of times that you said that there's going to be two linebackers on the field and then maybe that jack roll um which if that gets sawyer on the field more often i'm all, all for it but anyway with only two linebackers you're gonna have steel chambers and then you got eichenberg and then chip trianum who hopefully is having a good spring which that's all i've seen is he's had, he's been having a good spring coming in it's gonna be difficult for any players to to break that rotation but i think cj hicks has what it takes because you know he's the top rated player coming out of ohio so keeping that ohio boy you know in town he's he only played 30 snap 30 snaps in the spring game but he came came away with seven tackles or tackles depending on what part of the uh, the game it was if it was thud or they actually hit someone um he's already got size like he's coming in he already looks like a college linebacker um He's got athleticism. He's got everything that you need. Um, the Buckeyes love their athletes at linebacker as much as it may have not seemed like it. You know, when we when we played Alabama and we were trying to cover the Heisman Trophy winner uh, with Tough Portland, um, <laughs> that will all I I still see it in my nightmares. You, you just see thirty three just turning the other way, and you're just like, "What are we doing?" Right, um, right. But no, C.J. Hicks is. He looks like he, he's the truth. Um, with just the two linebackers playing, it's going to be difficult. But um, And honestly, I hope that this year they don't do what they did last year and play 90 defensive players every, you know, every other play. Um, but C.J. Hicks is already showing that he's got the size, he's got the quickness, and he comes down um, like a you know, train on fire, bat out of hell, however, whatever cliche you want to say. Um, and there's a really good possibility that if he breaks that rotation, we're going to have two number 11s uh, on offense and on defense that are going to be uh, household names by the end of the season. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. With the formation and the different things that are going on with the defense, I have read a little bit lately or about a couple weeks ago, it kind of gave me a good, a good update about how they might line up and it might affect how C.J. Hicks plays in the fall. So they're still probably going to use four down linemen. One guy might be a stand-up guy, Jack Sawyer, Javante Jean-Baptiste. I mean, I would even love to see JC Tuomaloa be in a stand-up role. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've saw it in, I, I saw it in high school. He can do it in college because I do believe that the skill set that he has and from what we saw last year, that'll translate to the starting role at Ohio State. So you probably you may still three down linemen. One guy will be up or down, depending on what it is. But then when you play in Iowa or Wisconsin. 
I think you'll probably see four down linemen hand on the ground the entire time. And then a third linebacker who might be maneuverable and move around. So you're going to have a Will, a Sam, and a Mike, a middle, um, a weak side, and a strong side linebacker. And maybe the strong side linebacker might be Reed Carrico, who might come in and be someone that's in the gap, up and back, and doing things like that. So the the formation of things of, of that will be a little in- interesting to see. But you're still going to have that second linebacker. I like Still Chambers. I like Eichenberg. I like Simon. There is a role for C.J. Hicks to be a fourth or fifth linebacker used at Ohio State. I don't know how often Jim Knowles is going to rotate those guys. I don't think we're going to see what we saw last. I mean, dude, one of my friends even told me, like, they're like, dude, you're going out of control. You're going overboard with this rotation stuff. I said, then what? tell me why former players are saying, what are they doing? Former players are saying they were used to playing 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100, even 100 steps in a game. And that's what they were used to. This is even going back to the Urban Meyer days. So if mm-hmm. former players that recently played at Ohio State are complaining about it, maybe my gripe is justifiable because you don't see anybody else doing those things either. But at Ohio State, things were different. And it's a luxury, literal luxury. Ohio State only lost two games last year based off the way the defense played last year on the field. But, but C.J. Hicks does have a phenomenal job, does have the chance to get on the field um, this year, because as he progresses, he's not battling with Sonny Styles to get on the field. They're two phenomenal talents, and they play two different positions. And mm-hmm. so with him having that room there, and I think having Trainum come in and be a newcomer. Now, granted, he's played football in college, but Trainum was a running back at Arizona State. He was not a linebacker. Yeah, he's coming back home, but he's still playing a new position. So with that in mind, Hicks can still wow the coaches and say, look, I know I'm new, but I belong on the field. You're going to have a hard time keeping me off of it. I mean, when you have a coaching change like this, because we've, you know, they they replaced both the linebackers coach and the defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. And then he enrolled early. Everyone's on equal footing. At least that's what that's that's one. That was always one of my uh, philosophies as a coach. You come in, everyone's on equal footing. I don't care if you're a senior or a freshman. If you can play, you can play. So him enrolling early and then doing what he did at the the spring game and then obviously all the athleticism and so on and so forth is definitely going to help him um, get into the rotation um, because perhaps maybe last year they just weren't – I mean, the defense was awful, so they weren't um, confident in the guys that they had. So they just kept trying to mix and match, trying to find that guy and so on and so forth. And maybe we eventually found it, like with uh, Sawyer and Tui Meloau and stuff like that, and Denzel Burke. But you know, when you drop games to Oregon and then you get completely embarrassed against the team up north, it's just you got to wake up and you got to roll with the guys you got. And I'm glad that they made the moves that they did um, because Knowles is is a great coach, and I kind of still think that Al Washington was a Michigan plant. <laughs> I'm not diving into that one at all. We're almost out of time as well, so we're going to keep on moving forward. Last but not least, and maybe one of the most talented position rooms at Ohio State has. Now, I'm saying that because the quarterbacks are getting un- or not getting the attention that they deserve. I think Ohio State has three amazing, I mean, literal amazing quarterbacks in C.J. Stroud and Kyle McCord and Devin Brown. But the room that gets the most attention – Brian Hartline put on a phenomenal infomercial in the first round of the draft with having back-to-back-to-back wide receivers taken. Now, the one was not a receiver last year at Ohio State, but Buckeye fans still love Jamison Williams. Caleb Burton was the last one on your list, and you had numerous ways you could could have gone um, with this. Um, I would have loved to see Dallin Hayden, a four-star recruit from uh, the state of Tennessee. He's not in, in school just yet. He'll be there. I believe in June, and then we'll see him in fall camp in the fall in August. But Caleb Burton's the last of the three Buckeyes you expect to see a um, some big plays and some splash plays from in the fall in 2022. Um, why did he make the cut? Well, assuming that the offense is as good as it is, and then the defense is even that even has a pulse, all three of these guys are going to get playing time in the second half of games. Yes, um, yes. Hopefully, the Buckeyes start off early with Notre Dame, and it just goes but yeah Caleb Burton is in probably the the deepest room um maybe even outside of edge 
on this roster because you mm-hmm. got you got JSM, you got Mika Muka, you got Marvin Harrison Jr., you got Julian Fleming, who are probably the top four, and then you got the two older guys with uh, Ballard and um, Cam Bab. Mm-hmm. And then you got these new guys. You got Caleb Burton, then you got Caleb Brown. That's not going to get confusing at all. Um, <laughs> Kyon Graves, and then um, so there's a lot of talent that's coming in. I think I really liked what I saw from Caleb Burton. Um, he. I mean, all of them are going to get their playing time, assuming that they they take care of business. But getting that spring in, those the spring practices and then the spring game always help. Um, Caleb Brown looked to me like he's definitely very raw and he's going to need a lot more work. But um, I don't know why, but he's, he reminded me of... Uh, Oh boy, who's oh, I can't remember his name. The he was a highly touted wide receiver that just it never felt like he got it, and he he caught that game winner against Penn State with Haskins. I can't remember his name. Oh my, I don't know. Not Johnny Dixon, but either way, he looks like he likes he looks like a a, a bigger guy. He's a bit lanky. Um, he's definitely a lengthy receiver. Um, but Wait, was it Benjamin that, Victor? That's the one. Okay. Okay. He seems, it seems he seems a bit like Benjamin Victor because it doesn't look like he's got blazing speed, but he gets up field pretty quickly. Now he only had the two two receptions. He had the five targets, and it seemed like he only played with um, Devin Brown. But I liked what I saw because um, there, you know, Devin Brown was a little inaccurate every now and then, overthrew his receivers, and there was a couple instances where I think that he probably could have turned up field um, if he got Burton in the ball. Um, he could have turned up field. So I like what I saw out of Caleb Burton. It's probably the the most hot take of the three. Definitely the, uh, um, you know, it's going to be hard for him to get into the rotation, but I think that he has what it takes. And it looks like he's got, he's already started to get a little bit more polished with his route running and his, his ability to catch. Yeah, I, I like it. Um, it's kind of weird because the receivers at Ohio State has, they are so talented. So trying to find a guy that could make it and play and be consistent, even in a quarter on the field as a freshman, is very, very hard. But he has the goods. He has the talent. He can do it. My gut says this year's team can be like 2019, to where you're up by 30, 40 points by halftime, so your your, your backups are playing most mm-hmm. of the second half. That's my gut feeling. Um, I don't really see a game. I mean, we may see a game like Nebraska last year. And if that happens, I don't have much hair, but I'll pull some hair out because that game still haunts me because Ohio State, I'll say it till I die. Ohio State should have lost that game. They had no reason winning that game. Now, granted, they made the right plays to win the game. So maybe mm-hmm. saying they have no they had no reason to win the game is 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 false. Okay, great. But Nebraska pl- outplayed Ohio State on that day. Like you you cannot say anything. Their defense showed up. They were more physical, and they gave Ohio State fits. But those are those types of games. I still think this is going to be more 2019, even against Notre Dame, which is a talented team. Don't get me wrong. Notre Dame is really talented. I still think Ohio State, with their defensive line, will dictate more than what people think, even though Notre Dame has a phenomenal Mm O-line. I think Ohio State's D-line will will hold their own against them. So I – that's just kind of where I stand with with all this, but um, I, I still think latter part of third quarter, fourth quarter, you'll see Burton. He has a chance. I'm, now, granted, you're probably going to see a lot, a lot of runs during that time period, yeah. but I do know Ryan Day wants to get his quarterbacks some throws in once they're on the field. Doesn't matter what the score is. He still wants to get him to get some quality reps on the field in real live game play. Burton could end the year with three touchdowns, and that's not even being an exaggeration based on how Ryan Day is, based on how I do believe this team will play, if he ends three, maybe four touchdowns, uh, is a staple on special teams. I mean, buddy, that's a great way to wow your coach and then to say, look, I know I'm a freshman, but y'all put me here. Y'all allow me to come here. I signed. I deserve to be on the field, and I'm going to prove to you you can't take me off of it. That's how Olave started. He, he yeah. seriously broke out in that, in that Michigan game his freshman year, um, played a lot of special teams, and then – made his way into the rotation the next year. It's going to be interesting, um, you know, because 2023, there's a possibility that only Jackson Smith and Jigba is gone. So there's there's going to be massive shoes, but also a very small window um, to move forward. But, yeah, I think I think Burton 
um, has what it takes to at least show that he belongs um, and then, you know, dominate the, the, the playing time that he has. Before the show, I made a joke to Drew about how last week I could not talk. My words were not coming through <laughs> clearly. I believe that today um, is a better day and things are getting better off this week. Uh, just last week was just one of those weird weeks where nothing in my brain came out clearly. And I hope that things are getting better with Drew here on the show. Drew Crabtree, managing editor of LWO Sports. Glad to have you back on. I kind of hinted at it earlier. Him and I will talk off air about a time to have him back. I want to talk about the running back rotation, the duo. Because I do believe that Mayan Williams, Trayvon Henderson, those two guys together can be not just one of the better duos in the Big Ten, one of the better running back duos in the entire country. Drew, if you could let everyone know where they can catch some of the things you're writing, not just for LWO Sports, but also Bengal stuff as well, and also where they can catch you on Twitter. Yep. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I changed my Twitter profile. Uh, it's just at Drew Crabtree 12 now. Um, I just want to throw in a note about the running backs. This could be yeah. hard to keep Evan Pryor off the field. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, LWO Sports, uh, managing editor, I do still write stuff there. Um, we got a great team of uh, of writers that are, you know, building their craft and so on. And then I also cover the Bengals, and I did a lot for the uh, NFL draft over the past um, couple of months. Um, that's last word on sports NFL. Um, so check us out. We got writers from all over the place, and um, we're doing great things. Um, and if you follow hockey, for example, our hockey department is one of the, um, you know, better hockey departments in you know, the online sports media world. So thanks for having me on, Jay. I love it. No problem, man. No problem at all, guys. You can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. We'll keep rolling with Buckeye offseason talk all offseason long. And like I said earlier, this will, be the not, this will not be the last time Drew is on the podcast talking about the Ohio State football team. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the week. Let's get at it. Let's have some fun. And remember, guys, there's only two words you can end this show with as they're talking about Future Buckeyes, go Bucks. <laughs>